So now let's look at a few methods of queue switching and I will be uh, quite brief. Whole point here is to give you an idea about the underlying physics. So the simplest of methods is, for example, a mechanical method of rotating mirrors or for that matter, you know, a, a chopper. Uh, a chopper is a device which is like a fan that blocks the beam periodically. So all that I have, the idea is simple. So we have this cavity where there is an active medium. There is mirror M1 and the mirror M2 is such that this is rotating about this axis which is perpendicular to it. So clearly you will see that this forms a cavity only when the mirror gets completely aligned dynamically at a particular point in time. Right, and that is when the lasing begins. For all other orientations of the mirror, the loss is extremely large, so the Q factor is extremely low. Right, and uh, so this is how the rotating mirror works. In the case of the chopper, what you have is a is a device which is more like uh, wings of a fan, and you know this is rotating. So this device is kept this uh, chopper is kept it chops the beam uh, right because these are opaque so this chops the beam periodically and uh, this is kept perpendicular to the propagation direction of the beam and every time the the second mirror is blocked you see we have large loss and only when the mirror is aligned that you have this high quality factor and hence the lasing begins now typically you see that these rotations can typically best be at the at the rate of roughly about thousands or 10,000 rotations per minute. So this is not really uh, sufficiently uh, fast uh, because uh, you see you will still get uh, in the in the regions of you know uh, microseconds and and milliseconds. So that's the kind of pulses you would get. But then um, if you want to go for faster pulses, one is to employ another mechanism, not this rotating mirrors, but something else for us to do uh, to get pulses which are shorter and uh, and faster. Uh, now there are issues with this. First of all, uh, the main issue with this is that the switching is uh, slow, right? And then you know the lasing begins only when the mirror is completely exposed. Uh, you know mirror is perfectly aligned or completely exposed to the gain cell you know th that kind of you know limits and then you know there are there are going to be trail offs because as the mirror gets slightly misaligned you are going to have sp spatially inhomogeneous beam and so on so there are issues with this kind of a system not really used widely but it conveys the idea of this switching of the quality factor right q from uh, from a very low value to a high value so, and this switching happens when the cavity is perfectly aligned. All right, so another uh, way to achieve this electro optic switching. So, what you do is you employ a mechanism in which you can use external voltage switch or external, uh, external source to actually switch the properties of an electro optic crystal the idea is the following i have uh, the mirror m1 i have the the gain medium right which could be occupying that space and then what one does is introduces a, a polarizer imagine that this is a polarizer and you have a electro optic crystal so there are uh, I will come to that for example let it be Kerr effect right and there is the mirror M2 M1 and M2 so this is my lasing cavity so the point is this you have electro optic crystal this crystal is such that if I I apply a voltage across this crystal right this is an external voltage so when I apply an external voltage right there is a field that is produced between these two terminals uh, and because of that external field electric field what happens is that this the this crystal exhibits birefringence 
if the degree of birefringence, if this is uh, proportional uh, to uh, V square, that is the voltage applied and the square of it, then you see this is what is called as a Kerr effect. This is known as the Kerr effect. Whereas if the degree of birefringence, if this is going to be proportional to V itself, then this is what is called as the Pockels effect. Anyway, the idea is the following. By birefringence, what I mean is that there is going to be a refractive index uh, which is in one direction, there is going to be a certain refractive index. Whereas in the direction perpendicular to the applied field, the refractive index is going to be different. right? So they are going to be essentially, uh, depending on the polarization of the input beam, the light is going to see two different refractive indices uh, uh, with for the two different polarizations that that come through. You have a polarizer here. So let the polarizer allow a beam that is maybe oriented at let's say plus 45 degrees, right? This is the pass axis of the of the polarizer at plus 45 degrees. So then the light goes through the polarizer. It experiences two different refractive indices for the component which is parallel and perpendicular to the applied field. And then you see that because these two indices are different, one can arrange the length of this crystal such a way that at the end of it, you would get a, a phase difference of 90 degrees between them, between the two polarizations. And you see that at the end of this, the light becomes circularly polarized, right? Now, if this circularly polarized light hits the mirror, right, M2, and then it comes back, you see that the circular polarization is now converted back into linear polarization, but something dramatic has happened. In the return path, the, the polarization that is created now is at minus 45 degrees, right? So this is at the minus 45 degrees, this is the reverse journey. So you see that this minus 45 degrees is blocked by the polarizer, hence there is no feedback through the cavity, right? And if you switch off the external voltage, then clearly the, the polarization is maintained uh, across the, the traversal through this electro-optic crystal. And hence, at the end of the day, what you get back is st uh, strong feedback because then the light is basically polarized and the, there is no change of the polarization as it propagates through the electro-optic crystal, right? So this is essentially a way to actively switch uh, or rather electronically switch the feedback which is provided to the gain cell, right? So this is our gain cell. Okay, so this is the way it essentially functions. And you see that uh, yeah, for the Kerr effect, one applies a voltage, you know, in the range of about 10 to 20 kilovolts. Uh, whereas in the Pockel cell, one applies a lower voltage. So that is the typical, uh, you know, uh, numbers that one one uses for this electro-optic switching. So the last mechanism which I want to uh, talk about uh, is the saturable absorber. So another method of Q switching is by using a shutter uh, inside a cavity, which is simply a cell with absorbing material, right? So this is the for example, the cavity, the gain cell, and what you have here is a saturable absorber, a material whose absorption can be saturated. The saturation is quite akin to what we have already seen, like for gain, just like the gain coefficient gets saturated and decreases, similarly the absorption coefficient of a saturable absorber decreases in presence of sufficient uh, intensity. So what happens is basically the, the shutter is off in a sense because the light that is produced by pumping uh, in the gain cell, the population inversion is building up. And because uh, the light is getting absorbed by the saturable absorber uh, for low intensities of that light, so you see that there is hardly any feedback experienced by the gain cell. 
right so as the gain increases because of pumping you see that eventually there is sufficient intensity generated such a way that my eye cavity becomes larger than the the saturation intensity associated with the absorber right so this is this i sat becomes uh, is the measure above which the uh, the the saturable absorber would saturate so you see as the intensity builds up you see that uh, once the cavity intensity becomes larger than the saturable absorber uh, uh, saturation intensity in that case the absorber becomes saturated or it becomes transparent the the absorption coefficient of the absorber uh, is lowered and hence you would see that suddenly the light is able to propagate back and forth within the cavity as this uh, absorber has uh, become transparent for all practical purposes so you see this is what happens once the saturable absorber is saturated or bleached uh, there is tremendous feedback and the laser pulse builds up and you get a giant pulse out from such a cavity right now uh, again uh, it is important to realize there is this is a different kind of uh, you know q switching uh, unlike what we have uh, discussed earlier so uh, this kind of q switching with the saturable absorber is called a passive q switching this is a passive mode of q switching simply because one is uh, one is using the intrinsic property and not applying any external fields or any mechanical uh, intervention to achieve the uh, switching right so this is a passive mode of q switching unlike the two previous modes wherein you see we have applied a external voltage or in this situation we applied a mechanical motion rotation externally uh, these would be the active modes of q switching uh, in contrast to this passive mode uh, the other important thing which i want to mention related to uh, saturable absorber is um, you see there is a finite time it takes for the saturable absorber to bleach in that finite time you see that some of the, the there are multiple modes of uh, spontaneous emission which are traveling trying to go back and forth but because it takes certain time you see that multiple modes initially would make it across the the gain medium and you see that all these modes would have their own associated losses so you see that the mode which is associated with the least loss is the one that would go back and forth repeatedly thereby surviving whereas all the other modes would have died out so because the photons can make several thousand round trips uh, going back and forth you see that there is a mode selection that happens and hence uh, with the saturable absorber typically one one ends up with the output which is mostly single mode it is this slow saturation that is happening which allows the photons to travel back and forth several thousands of times is what is giving rise to this this selection between modes arising out of the mode dependent loss allowing the filtering of modes because of the mode dependent loss very unlike the electro optic effect for example wherein you see that the the switching of the voltage is so quick that the photons can at most make a few round trips uh, you know maybe 10 round trips so you see that typically the electro optic switched giant pulse will be uh, will be having a multimodal character here i'm talking about the longitudinal modes of the cavity so that in a sense you know captures the ideas related to q switching just as a final note i want to emphasize that uh, typically q switching is used for uh, achieving switching uh, in the time scales of uh, you know uh, nanoseconds if we want to get to pulses which are shorter than nanoseconds one needs to do something more and that is something we will will discuss in the in the next lecture which is going to be on mode locking uh, because that will invariably involve multiple modes to work together to get a short pulse thank you